They came for gold. They stayed for the railroad. Now, their new country is turning against them. A girl from northern China gambles on life in the American West. While a showman turned firebrand will forge a path for the first Chinese Americans. At a bustling port in Hong Kong, young men board a ship bound for a strange land. Most are gambling on dreams of riches, but for one young woman, fate has dealt an unlucky hand. At 19 years old, she was sold by her family for food. Brought from the north as a captive, she will now set sail for Gold Mountain. For months at sea, she shares the cargo hold with other young women kidnapped or sold by their families, all bound for a terrible trade that has exploded in the wake of the gold rush, human trafficking. The heart of the business lies in San Francisco, with the hip Yi Tong, the first criminal gang to capitalize on Chinatown's mostly male population. Foreign来的都是年轻的单身汉，啊，呃，我们现在讲叫快乐的，呃，贵族单身汉，其实是他们是他们当时是非常不快乐的一个族群，单身没有家庭的温暖，那么在生理上的这个这个需要也得不到满
Page Act made it illegal for Chinese women to come to the United States if they were going to engage in prostitution. It proved an uneven law in that it was extremely effective in keeping out Chinese women um, because it was easy to level prostitution uh, charges against any Chinese woman. 当时男女之间的比例是绝对的不平衡panic breaks out in the east. A change in currency laws wreaks havoc on Wall Street, triggering a global depression. Businesses collapse and unemployment spreads. Still, eager Chinese workers arrive in the western ports. One of the things that happens during the 1870s is that as the employment opportunities became harder to find. There was sufficient animosity toward the Chinese because the Chinese were willing to work for lower pay than the whites were. This is a chronic complaint of people against immigrants because the latest immigrants are going to take the lowest pay. In October 1871, frustration erupts into violence. In Los Angeles, a mob of 500 storms into Chinatown and launches a full-scale assault. The pillage Chinatown. They set fire to the buildings. That night, 18 Chinese men and two Chinese women are lynched. Known as the Chinatown War, the riot becomes a stark symbol of the Chinese community's isolation. But they quickly prove they won't be an easy target. The Chinese forced the city of Los Angeles to call for a grand jury. And the grand jury, in fact, arrests and indicts over 38 white people. It was a sign from the Chinese community that they would fight back and that they would bring in the law on behalf of their community. A long way from the west coast, a pack train arrives in Warren, Idaho. Facing a new life in a new country, she'll start with a new name. She arrives in Warren in 1872 and got off the pack horse and Charlie Bemis, who had a saloon there and was a gambler, by way of welcoming her, said, uh, here's Polly. And uh, that seems to be where she acquired that nickname. The details of the arrangement have been lost to time. But it's likely Polly was brought to Warren not as a prostitute, but as a concubine. For a Chinese man to purchase a woman for $2,500, he says that he was serious about her being a concubine for him personally. So once Polly was purchased by this Chinese businessman in Warren, she effectively became his property. Polly's owner is a wealthy merchant who owns a saloon in town. In frontier outposts like Warren, these dens of hard drinking and gambling are the heart of life in the Wild West. The saloon was sort of everything. It was the, the public house, the general store, where people picked up their mail. It was the core of the town. A rival saloon is owned by East Coast gambler, Charlie Bemis. Polly and Charlie form an unlikely friendship, one that, with a bit of luck, could be the key to her freedom. <laughs> 
1876. In an election year, both the Republicans and Democrats zero in on a common enemy, Chinese immigrants. Both parties pander to voters by calling for restrictions on Chinese immigration. The mayor of San Francisco, Jackson Bryan, inspires 20,000 protesters to fill the streets of San Francisco. The Chinese district associations, known as the Six Companies, try to ease the tension by asking their own community to write letters home, exhorting their fellow Chinese to stop coming to America. They then send a letter to Washington, appealing directly to President Grant. San Francisco, 1878. A crowd of workers gathers near City Hall. Irishman Dennis Kearney is staging a rally against corporate greed and what he considers the root of the problem, Chinese labor. They have made a science of public robbery and speculation. They have seen Dennis Kearney emerges in San Francisco in the 1870s and was a part of the organization of something called the Working Man's Party of California, whose slogan was, the Chinese must go. Dennis Kearney was a tribune of working class anger in a time of robber barons and vast inequality. And unfortunately, this Irish immigrant from County Cork also developed a virulent anti-Chinese hatred. So he wedded his anti-capitalist politics to anti-Chinese prejudice. The bloated aristocracy has gone to China in search of a cheap slave. Kearney was this apostle of nativism in the United States, which was quite ironic because he wasn't American born. He was Irish, and he was a gifted speaker and a demagogue, and he could really rile a crowd up um, in ways that very few people could. They have come from China to compete with free Americans. For six years, a depression has caused unemployment to skyrocket. Workers fear the few remaining jobs will go to the lowest bidder, who until now were usually the Irish. The Irish were fairly low on the totem pole in American society when they first immigrated. But in the Chinese, they found a group that was even lower on the totem pole than they were. So there was a lot of animosity between the Irish and the Chinese, born of the fact that the Chinese were willing to undercut them in wages. The hateful rhetoric threatens Chinese across the West Coast. It hasn't yet reached Warren, Idaho. But according to a popular legend, the atmosphere here is tense for another reason. Polly's owner faces off against her friend, Charlie Bemis, in a high-stakes game of poker. The Chinese merchant tries to end a brutal losing streak by raising the stakes with his most valuable possession, Polly. Charlie Bemis wins the hand and Polly's freedom. There's a very romantic story about Polly Bemis, and, and that story is that she was won in a poker game by Charlie Bemis. <laughs> 
The poker game story, like many stories, it's a great story, but it just isn't true. How Polly became a free woman has been shrouded in Western myth. But eight years after her arrival, according to a census document, she was no longer a slave. We don't know the name of Polly's owner. People have called him Hong King, but there is nobody in Warren that had that name. By 1880, something happened to him. Either he died or he went back to China. And Charlie Beam may have stepped in and said, do you want to come and live with me, do my housekeeping? And they could have been having a romantic relationship then. We don't know. But in 1880, she was living with him in the same household. Polly begins working for Charlie at his local boarding house. And for now, has found freedom and security. But elsewhere, hostility towards the Chinese is boiling over. The anti-Chinese climate spurs one man to set off on an unprecedented PR roadshow, Wang Chin Fu. Born in northern China and educated by American missionaries, Wang stuns audiences from city to city by giving them their first taste of Chinese culture. What a scene that must have been when Wang Chin Fu barnstormed across the country. Especially early in his career, he appeared on stage in full Chinese regalia. And he had a long queue at that time that was so long that it dragged along the ground when he walked. So he seemed extremely exotic. Wang was a showman. And initially in the United States, he made his living as a lecturer. Mostly in the East and in the Midwest, he would go around to big cities and small towns alike. And he was generally the first Asian face that most of these people had ever seen. And Wang would show them oriental robes or a slipper designed for a woman who had had bound feet or an abacus, things that they found very interesting. Most Americans going out to hear him speak had never heard directly from a Chinese person. So his mere presence as this eloquent, funny, irreverent, and thoughtful man blew people away. Wong takes on not just the stereotypes, but his own community by campaigning against the illicit trades of Chinatown. He felt that Chinese needed to abandon certain customs in order to be good Americans. And they included opium smoking, prostitution, some of the habits that Americans associated with Chinese. But most of these enterprises were in Chinese hands. The very boat that brought Wang Chin Fu to San Francisco in the fall of 1873 also held more than a dozen young Chinese women who were destined to work in the sex trade. Lo and behold, they land in San Francisco Harbor and somebody writes a letter to the police chief saying that there are these 14 girls on board who need to be rescued. Now, we now know that letter was written by Wang Chin Fu. And it's said that a few days later, uh, Wang was set upon by a bunch of toughs, um, a bunch of high binders, as they called them, in, uh, in a street, Market Street in San Francisco, beaten up. And he was also often warring with elements in Chinatown and in the Chinese communities and uh, escaped narrowly death <laughs> several times, at least by his recounting. In 1874, Wang becomes a U.S. citizen, one of the country's first Chinese Americans. He'll also be one of the last for some time. 1882. Congress proposes a bill to reduce Chinese immigration and cut off the influx of workers from the East. After helping to build the West through the mining industry, agriculture, and the building of the Transcontinental Railway. The Chinese now find their new home shutting them out. In Washington, a few voices stand out in support of the Chinese. Connecticut Senator Joseph Hawley is one of them. An exclusion based upon race or color is unphilosophical, unjust, and undemocratic. But the dissenters are in the minority. On May 6, 1882, President Chester A. Arthur signs a historic new law, 
the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's the first American law that specifically denies a racial group, a particular group, entry into the United States. It writes into law basically a racist policy over who can be an American. Nothing like this had ever happened before. There had never been a law that singled out a particular group of people for discriminatory treatment as far as immigration and citizenship was concerned. This was the first one, and the Chinese resented it deeply. With the law of the land, the Chinese have little hope for building a future. The choice is to remain a bachelor in America or return to their families in China. The combined effect of the page law that kept out Chinese women, the exclusion laws that made it difficult for Chinese men to come and go, and the laws against naturalization that did not allow Chinese to become citizens made it very difficult for there to be a second generation of Chinese. One year after the passage of the Exclusion Act, the Chinese population in America plummets by over 12,000 people. In newspapers across the country, the Chinese are caricatured as invaders, stealing jobs and eating bizarre foods. The political cartoons at the time are really powerful to give you sort of a snapshot of how the Chinese were viewed. I think that it was partially that that was such a grotesque idea to Americans and it sort of associated the Chinese with animalistic behavior. But I think it was also an economic argument it was saying the Chinese can live on rats and they can live on rice and, and white Americans cannot. And if the Chinese continue to compete with white Americans that we will soon be forced to be eating rats and rice. Now, 啊這種不實之詞哈,圍繞就是說跟中山有關的,在美國社會廣為流傳,其中之一就是什麼呢,就中國人吃老鼠。後來這個王王王金我就就說了,說那個就選舉上,老鼠幾百塊錢,就說
long sets his sights on the face of the anti-Chinese movement, Irishman Dennis Kearney. With his usual flair, he challenges Kearney to a public debate. Wang's challenge to Kearney for debate took the form of a letter. And it was a, uh, there was nothing gracious about it. It was provocative and it was condescending. And it took, really took the form of a denunciation of the Irish. He says, I belong to the most ancient empire on this globe. The flag of my country floats over the third greatest navy in the world. Yours is to be seen derisively displayed on the 17th of March in the public streets and triumphantly hoisted on an occasional gin mill. You gotta love it. Kearney ignores the challenge. So Wong publicly ups the ante. He said, well, okay, if you don't want to have a debate, let's have a duel. Which was, of course, an absurdity in the 1880s, but it really got a lot of ink for Wang Qingfu. So the newspaper guys go to Wang's office and uh, ask him, what kind of, what kind of weapons um, do you suggest? And he says, I suggest, I would suggest to Dennis Kearney that he have his choice of weapons, chopsticks, Irish potatoes, or corrupt guns. Again, Kearney brushes off the challenge. But eventually, Wong will get his duel, armed with the most powerful weapon of all, his wit. Across the West, the Chinese encounter an increasingly hostile environment. The recent passage of the Exclusion Act only adds to the climate of fear. It's okay, just like, no problem, just like, you're doing The most vicious acts of anti-Chinese purges all occur after the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed. It's a carte blanche. It's a permission slip to do violence upon the Chinese people. In Eureka, California, a mob takes matters into their own hands. They inform the Chinese community that in 24 hours, they'll be removed from the town. The Chinese pack all Friday night and march down to the warehouses on the wharf. They're kept under guard. These people were part of the community, people who you went to, or they did your laundry. They were nannies for your children. These people are now kept under guard. The next day, 300 Chinese men, women, and children are loaded onto steamships and sent to San Francisco. From California to Washington and Wyoming to Colorado, rioters torch Chinese homes and businesses. A throng in Tacoma, Washington, rounds up over 200 Chinese, forces them onto a train to Portland, and burns their homes to the ground. Seeing the Chinese was the threat of losing your job, of your business not being able to compete, and I estimate around 150 communities in the U.S. West expelled the Chinese. It was, it seems, contagious. This was an organized route to get the Chinese people to leave their communities, to leave the state, and to leave the United States. That's ethnic cleansing. We're not just talking about social discrimination. We're talking about literally being burnt out. The Citizens Committee deciding that they no longer wanted Chinese in their community and forcibly moving people out at gunpoint or under armed guards. In place of violence, some towns turn to economics. <laughs> 
the residents of Truckee, California, launch a boycott of all Chinese businesses. They would eliminate the Chinese by starving them out. Together, boycotts with you know, other forms of harassment and, and impending threats of violence created a state of terror for the Chinese. Following a massacre in Rock Springs, Wyoming, where at least 20 Chinese are killed, the Chinese ambassador steps in and demands reparations for the losses. Consistently, the Chinese counter each injustice by using the courts. The Chinese culture had a 5,000-year-old sophisticated tradition. There was a tradition of law, a tradition of banking, of land ownership. And the Chinese turned to all of these resources to fight back, one of which is to turn to the, the law. One Chinese legal victory sets a precedent that would help define civil rights battles in the United States for over a century to come. San Francisco City Council passed an ordinance saying that all wooden laundries had to register with the city and pay a tax. And this, on its face, seemed like a race-neutral law. But almost every single laundry that was in a wooden building was owned by a Chinese person. And so the Chinese challenged this law as racially discriminatory. 150 Chinese men are jailed for refusing to pay the tax. And the community turns to the Chinese Laundry Association to file a case that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Yik Wo versus Hopkins. We're on Spofford Alley. And I'm really happy to be here because the Red Storefront is one of my favorite spots in all of Chinatown. This is the former location of the Chinese Laundrymen's Association. And at the turn of the century, late 1800s, uh, they were responsible for one of the most important civil rights cases in American history. And when they won, they set a precedent, a legal precedent. This was the first time the Supreme Court had said, you cannot have a law that sounds neutral, but is used against one group. So Yikwo, since that time, has been used 150 times to overturn laws discriminating against blacks, against women, against gays. You know, there are six million visitors to Chinatown each year. And I guarantee you, very, very few know that in this little alley, in this little storefront, in, you know, Chinatown, came one of the most important civil rights decisions in American history. eighteen eighty seven new york city one year after the yikuo court case another chinese man would get his chance at a victory wang chin fu will finally meet dennis kearney face to face the boston globe eagerly announces the match writing to see and hear Wang Chin Fu and Dennis in a match to the finish on the Chinese question is a treat such as the intellectual sporting man of this country have not had for many years. The debate kicks off on the question of citizenship. Well, I understand, Mr. Curry, that you are against all Chinese. Wang makes the statement that he's an American citizen, which of course he is. He's, he was naturalized in 1874. But Kearney takes him on. Well, that is against the federal rules. And, and Kearney's right, because the federal decisions are basically saying that Chinese, even in some cases Chinese, would become citizens before the Exclusion Act, that their citizenship is somehow in question. At one point in the debate, Wang refers to our forefathers. Oh, forefathers, he says. What had your forefathers to do with it? And Kearney takes him up on it and says, how can you possibly call these people your forefathers? Your forefathers had nothing to do with it. Your forefathers were not the framers of the U.S. Constitution. And Wang says, well, I call them my forefathers because politically they were. The federal decisions. This is the moment when Wang crystallizes the idea that anybody who comes to America can be an American, can claim America's political history as his or her own. I am an American citizen. This was a man who was thinking like an American, which is what Wang Qingfu was all about. He was Chinese, but he was also American, and he was forging that path that said that you could be both of these things at the same time. Show me one Chinaman that was brought here on contract. Yeah. 
then you have the promise of a civil discussion quickly fades. I am not against the Chinese people as a race. I am against their being brought here as peons and slaves and servants. As barbs are exchanged, are and Wong uses Kearney's temper against him. Unnatural foreign born scum here in America ruining jobs for our people. It kind of devolves into trading insults. You know, Kearney sees the Chinese as subhuman and will not recognize Wong as his equal. The Chinese eat rats. And Wong sees Kearney in the same way. How dare you make such a comparison? Anybody who was looking for a real good intellectual sparring match would have been disappointed by the debate. You are a liar. It's a fighting word, sir, and if you do mean it, I shall throw you out that window. I did not come here to be insulted by the likes of you. It was a sensational moment. It was one of the few times in the late 19th century when a Chinese stood up to a racist on a national stage and got the better of him. But at the same time, to a lot of white Americans, this was kind of a, a circus. Wang's victory makes good headlines, but does little to win support for the Chinese in Washington. In May of 1892, Congress renews the Exclusion Act, adding a more draconian provision, the Geary Act. The Geary Act just continues this policy of singling out the Chinese and restricting their immigration, and then it makes it even worse. It forces them to register. It's basically apartheid-like registration regime where all Chinese have to go to a registration office, have their picture taken like they're a criminal, and it enrages a lot of Chinese in America. The Chinese were infuriated by the Geary Act. The Chinese Consul General in San Francisco said, this law puts us on a par with your dogs in the United States. In reaction to the law, Wang Chin Fu convenes a new political organization, the Chinese Equal Rights League. With other community leaders, they spearhead the largest campaign of civil disobedience in U.S. history. A broad swath of Chinese in America adopt the political strategy of refusing to cooperate with the Geary Act's registration provisions. The six companies say, don't sign up, don't cooperate with this racist law. And it works in the sense that the vast majority of Chinese in America refuse to sign up. We estimate 100,000 Chinese refused. One of the ways in which the civil disobedience was so effective was that if there's 100,000 people that failed to register, that meant that 100,000 people were now subject to deportation. And the United States didn't have the money to do it. It was basically calling America's bluff. Still, the loss of legal status threatens Chinese communities across the country. Even in remote mining towns, like Warren, Idaho. By now, Polly has long adapted to life in Warren, but her peace is threatened by the new laws. Since she was smuggled into the country, she has no official papers and could be deported at any moment. Charlie Bemis offers the one document that can keep her in the country, a certificate of marriage. In 1894, it would have been very unusual for a um, Euro-American man to marry a Chinese woman because in most places it was forbidden by law. There were anti-miscegenation laws on the books, meaning no race mixing. But at that time, it did not apply to Chinese people. In a simple ceremony in Charlie's house, Polly officially becomes Polly Bemis. Polly and Charlie Bemis decided to get married because she would have more protection as a person married to an American citizen. That might have been an impetus for their marriage and it might have been an impetus for them to move farther away from a community that could turn on her for being Chinese. Polly and Charlie moved to an isolated ranch 18 miles from Warren on the banks of the Salmon River the river of no return. 
there are two ways to get to Polly's cabin. One is to float down the river for a few days, and the other is to take a jet boat. It's hard to appreciate how remote Polly Bemis's cabin is until you try to get there. For the next 20 years, Polly and Charlie live a quiet life of subsistence. Their only neighbors are two ranchers across the river, Charles Shep and Pete Klinkhammer, who become their friends and partners in survival in the wilderness of Idaho. Much of what we know about life on the Salmon River is just the life of a subsistence homesteader who is having to do everything themselves. Polly was an enormously industrious person who gardened all the time and fished all the time. She did everything. Polly Bemis is as hard as nails. She's tough and resourceful. Polly's tough character would be critical to her survival when in 1922, their cabin goes up in flames and Charlie passes away. Shep and Klinkhammer help Polly rebuild her life and a new cabin where she'll continue to live on her own. This is Polly Bemis's cabin. It was built in 1924. Her neighbors across the river, Charlie Shep and Pete Klinkhammer, built this cabin for her after the first cabin burned and her husband, Charlie Bemis, died. And there are a few things in here that are said to be hers. There's a pair of broken glasses, the table, the stove the bed upstairs. Because it's furnished pretty much in the period, you can walk in here and just think, well, she's just stepped out. And you're in here just where she would have been. I think it's, it's pretty exciting. Polly would go on to live another decade securing her place on the American frontier. She becomes a beloved personality for visiting travelers, a Chinese-American pioneer. It's incredible to imagine that a woman like Polly Bemis could live here on this property and be self-sufficient. She made peace with her circumstances, and she made a great life for herself. We do know her name. And there were so many thousands who were nameless. So she really represents them. Polly puts a human face on an experience that we're incredibly curious about, but we don't know a great deal about. She came into the United States in 1872 and died in 1933. So that arcs the whole experience of the Chinese in the West. At the end of Polly's life, the old mining towns have gone quiet. The age of the Wild West now fading into history. Most Chinese in the U.S. have settled in Chinatowns, where they form a tight-knit support base for each other and for a young revolutionary who arrives in 1904, Sun Yat-sen. Over here is one of the places where Sun Yat-sen actually came to America and did a lot of work to help lead the revolution in 1911 that ended thousands of years of imperial rule. When Chinese were first coming over here in the mid-1800s, they were coming because their families were facing starvation. And why were their families facing starvation in China is the emperor had been doing a bad job. They were still angry that they felt like they had to leave, they were made to leave by the weakness of the government. So as little as they were getting paid, they were able to contribute lots of money to support the revolution in China, and that's why Sun Yat-sen came here. The supporters of the revolution 
San Francisco's Chinese community would soon face upheaval at home when their lives and their legal status are shaken to the core. Nineteen oh six, the Earth opens up, shaking at eight point three on the Richter scale. San Francisco is engulfed in flames. Chinatown burns, while authorities battle the blaze on wealthy Knob Hill, to no avail. Over three hundred thousand people are forced to evacuate. The quake devastates the city. But from chaos comes opportunity. In the fire, official paper records of citizenship are reduced to ashes. Now, incoming Chinese can claim they were born in the U.S. and had given birth abroad, allowing them to bring in a friend or relative as their child. The irony of the earthquake. The burning of the records actually, in some sense, may have saved the community, because thousands of Chinese were able to come over at this time by claiming that they were a relative、uh, to someone already here. And the people came over as a result of the earthquake and the fire that really did most of the damage. Became known as the paper sons and paper daughters. It's later determined. That for every paper son who filed to have a true claim to citizenship, it would mean every Chinese woman in the United States would have to have given birth to over 600 children. The Exclusion Act would remain in place until 1943, when, after 60 years, President Roosevelt calls the law an historic mistake. By then. The gold rush is a distant memory, and the struggles of the Chinese largely forgotten. The history of the violence against the Chinese is not remembered today, in part because it was so effective. By expelling the Chinese, these vigilantes were able to sort of the memory even of them being here. Little more than 60 years, the United States has doubled its territory, and the Chinese had been key to its growth. It's not an exaggeration to say that the Chinese who came to the United States were essential to the building of the West in a very literal sense. They also, to a greater degree than most of them expected, they stuck around. Those who stay have left generations of successful Chinese Americans, and a cultural legacy now embedded in the fabric of American life. We know that in Huan Zhong, there is a face that is filled with blood, blood, and blood. There is also the history of the Chinese Americans. The last one, the Chinese Americans, because they have always been constantly fighting to protect their rights, political and economic. 文化上的啊权益，他们实际上就说，呃，也是对美国这个民主自由，为这些原则的发扬光大，做出了不可磨灭的贡献。The story of the Chinese in the West is the story of America itself, of two cultures intertwined. Since the promise of riches lured the first Chinese to Gold Mountain.